There's a little known part of Hollywood that most people are not aware of, known as the audience test preview. The recently released book, Audienceology, reveals this for the first time. Our podcast series, Don't Kill the Messenger, brings this book to life, taking a peek behind the curtain. And now, join author and entertainment research expert, Kevin Getz. A Sunday, Monday, happy days. A Tuesday, Wednesday, happy days. Thursday, Friday, <laughs> happy day. Oh my gosh, I sing this song today for two reasons. One is that my guest today's IMDb profile, which I didn't know, says she acted in the Happy Days TV show in the 70s as a little girl. Uh, and number two is that she's the real life daughter of the late wonderful actor, Mr. C in Happy Days, Tom Bosley. That being said, I have to say that Amy Bear, who's here today, has come a long way from just having had a famous dad that we all know and love. She's one incredible woman in her own right who can absolutely stand on her own two feet. And now some might even say that Tom is Amy Bear's dad instead of the other way around, which is, hey, that girl over there, that's Tom Bosley's daughter. Amy's career in the entertainment industry is so unique because it spans major studios, independent financiers, and producing. Some of the points I just have to bring up are that she graduated magna cum laude from Georgetown. She began her career at CAA, the behemoth agency. Uh, she spent 17 years at Sony Pictures. She oversaw so many hits and developed all of them. Amy served as president and CEO of CBS Films from 07 to 2011. In 2012, she raised a seven-figure development fund and launched one of the industry's only female-led, independently financed content incubation companies, a novel idea at the time. 2018, she became board president of Women in Film, and most recently, she became president of Landline Pictures, a company that focuses on a... Oh, thank God, 50-plus audience, yay, for both theatrical and streaming distribution. Please help me welcome Amy Bear. Thank you, Kev. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. I am so excited to talk. In fact, I'm a little worried about this interview because <laughs> we have a shorthand, mm -hmm. and we've been, I think we crossed over as friends, I want to say, like 15 years ago, mm -hmm. where we were work friends, yes, but then became we became friends. Friend. And then Neil and Matt yes. and the whole and the family in Campbell Hall yes. and all of that. <laughs> so it's hard because I know a lot of information, mm -hmm. but there's also a lot I don't know. Mm -hmm. Here's what I do know yes. is you are, like I am, a tremendous advocate for the audience. Mm -hmm. I would call you an audience advocate. Mm -hmm. Tell me why that's important to you. Well, it's important because it's all that matters. So... I have said to anyone who will listen to me from my colleagues and the people who've worked with me, junior executives to filmmakers to most recently my husband, Matt, and I have been teaching a class at Chapman University. Co-teaching? Yes. It's been really fun. And you're not killing each other. No. It's actually been really fun. Ah. I was really nervous, but it was really fun. But, you know, we've said it to the students. The reality is if you don't know – who you are making a piece of content for, and I say content very intentionally because it isn't just film or television. It is all content. If you do not know who the audience is for what you're making, don't make it. Mm. There was a time, and we won't mention the movie because <laughs> I don't want to call out anyone, but it was a very, very well done movie, mm -hmm. I will say. And it was one of your first mm -hmm. as running a movie company, mm -hmm. CBS Films. And I remember having lunch with you, and it was sort of a cautionary tale. I was saying, you know, I'd just be really careful. Now, hindsight is twenty twenty, mm -hmm. and of course, I didn't want to play Monday morning quarterback, mm -hmm. but that was already in production. Sure. There's not much to do about it. But I remember saying to you, I was worried, and you were not worried. Mm -hmm. And then the movie came out, and it really didn't work mm -hmm. theatrically. And I remember, to your credit, and man, to your credit— <laughs> We had some other lunch, uh, I don't know, years later, and and you said, without missing a beat, you told me not to make that movie, mm -hmm. and I should have listened. Now, who says that? Well, I think that anyone who's authentic and honest 
says that. You know, I mean, we, you and I both know there are just as many authentic and honest people in the business as there are the other version. And a lot of those people are running studios. And it's hard to say. I mean, it is. It's it's hard to say when you're wrong. But what's the point? Like, what? who are you hiding it from? The but whole you world made, knows. You made a great movie. So let's talk about it. And I it actually tested well, I, if you remember. It tested not well. It tested extremely yes. well. So first of all, my saying not to do it mm. was based on research that I yes. had conducted, concept research mm-hmm. called capability mm-hmm. testing, which you've become a tremendous advocate Huge. of. Huge, yes. But that was not the point of right. this conversation. Mm-hmm. What I'm trying to say is you made a great movie. I don't think you've ever made a bad movie. You might have made average movies, mm-hmm. but you've made great movies. Mm-hmm. And this was a really good movie Mm -hmm. that deserved its existence, Mm -hmm. but there was not really an audience for it. What did you learn at CBS Films in that four years Mm. of running and being in charge and having that green light authority? Oh, it's such a great question. I always say that the experience I had at CBS was like an experiential MBA. I had come from 17 years at Sony, and I was an executive vice president, and there was a It's a legacy studio. There was an established system. It was very siloed. You know, the creative people did their thing. The business people did their thing. The marketing people did their thing. And when I got to – one of the things that was so unique about CBS was the moment that I started it. And that does play into the decisions that were made to greenlight that movie. So I started at CBS Films in October of 2007. In November of 2007, the writers struck. In February of 2008, the actor struck. And in September of 2008, the economy crashed. So in the one year, the first year I was there, every assumption that existed at the foundation of that studio was upended. And I started from scratch. I had no projects. I had no nothing. And had pressure because we had overhead. We were spending money to sort of ramp up to get movies made. But not only was I under pressure to get movies made at a time where the rules well, you of couldn't you, make movies. you couldn't make movies, but the economics and the audience component of movies changed that year. That was the beginning of social media having an impact on your opening weekend. It was right when Netflix was at the tipping point of going to, from being just a DVD business to an original content business. There were all these things that were changing at that moment. The thing about that movie, I think if I had to do it over again – I would have done it at a third of the price. It was way Mm. too expensive. And I think right now it's a movie that would play well on streaming, but just wasn't a movie that you could get people out of the house to go see. But there wasn't the streamer there that you could. But, you know, what's interesting is I'm going to change the wording Mm. of the MBA to the PhD Mm. (laughs) (laughs) because, my God, Mm -hmm. I mean, and how that has informed your decisions because after that – I think all your movies did make money. Mm -hmm. And also the movies that you then took out into the world as a producer Mm -hmm. have all made money, which is so crazy because you just think that as a person in development who doesn't have the final green line. I know you had a lot of influence. I think when Amy Pascal was was running Columbia, but nonetheless, she got to pull the trigger on that green light. And my question is, when you had that ability to do that. I mean, there's a big responsibility that comes Huge. with that. Huge. Huge. And part of the issue, I don't think, you know, I I always used to take issue with all the journalists that would write about how bad a movie was and studios don't get it. And I know you know this, and I have to say this for everybody who's listening. I don't know one studio executive who sets out cynically to make a bad movie just to make money. Everybody does their best to make the best movie they possibly can. 100%. And I think when you get into that job, Even if it is a cash play. Yes. It's by, perceived by the audience. Correct. They're never intending it to be Correct. that. Correct. They want it to be the best version. The best Better version. than it was before. Absolutely. Whatever it may be, a sequel or whatever Absolutely. it may be. And I think- When you get into that seat where you are pulling the trigger, what you realize is it isn't just a, I love this, I want to make it. There's an entire business necessity to feed the beast. You have to be making movies. There is a cost to money. There is a cost to the overhead. All of these things that are sitting there that you're expending on or that you're borrowing money from a bank or a line of credit in order to keep your business afloat, that costs money. So you have to be making things that can then be generating you better revenue. better pay your overhead. Correct. Keep your doors open. So there's a different consider- – And that's not even profit. No. That's just keeping your- – that's simple. And as an entrepreneur, God, I know that of so course. well. So in the case of that specific movie – The circumstances were it was a strike. So we were only able to make movies that were fully 
package that had a, a locked script because nobody could do any work on the script. And we had a director, we had a script, and we had a very big movie star. So you look at that and you say, okay, we have to make something. This is a movie that has a big movie star. It's skewed older. CBS has a network that skews older. There's a way to capture that audience know, potentially. It seemed like such a great So thing. there were a lot. But as you say, the flip side of it was it was a drama based on a true story with an uplifting ending, but still a difficult, serious drama. And, and dramas in theatrical, even at that time, even at that time, were really tough unless they were unanimously great reviews. Correct, right? and was too expensive. Even though it was less expensive than most of the movies I had made at Sony, <laughs> it was still too expensive. So there were circumstances that justified it, but the reality is, when you're pulling the trigger on those movies, when you're in that seat, it's never just about I love it, I want to make it. There's a whole other business component to it sure. that you have to factor in. And you had to learn that. Correct. That was not taught beforehand. No. And there's no, no school that teaches no. it. Mm-mm. I have to say, as an entrepreneur starting out in my living room, <laughs> cashing in everything I own to start my business, mm-hmm. boy, can I relate to knowing what that, yeah. that really feels like. It's terrifying. And what you've done now is so extraordinary with the latest iteration of Landline mm-hmm. Pictures, which is, we laugh about a, a phrase that I say, make a movie for everybody Make a movie for somebody, but don't make a movie for nobody. Nobody. <laughs> and you're making movies for somebody. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. And that is a great model. It's almost a model that can't fail. When I say that is if you stay in your lane and know your audience and then budget appropriately, which is what you didn't do in the other one. Again, mm-hmm. a great picture, a good idea, not mm-hmm. a great idea mm-hmm. on the, the one we talked about mm-hmm. previously. But now you're making more high concept Mm -hmm. ideas. You understand the audience super well. Mm -hmm. You research that audience. You know who they are. It really portends and points to the fact that you're going to be successful oh. almost every time out. Well, thank you. You know, I... It's not even meant... I don't no, even mean I it appreciate as that. a stroke. No, what no, I'm, I know. I mean it that you really understand a business model. Yes. And I... One of the things that I am so excited about in terms of landline, is it is a lane that we own 100%. There's a couple of other companies out there that are dabbling in it, but they're not exclusively in it. And how did it get formed again? So um, MRC, Media Rights Capital, who has been around for about 15, 16 years, two very enterprising men, Modi Witzik and his partner Asif, they started MRC mostly as a investment company, right? They would package projects, take them to market. They got on the map in a big way because their first big television sale was um, House of Cards. They put that together, sold it to Netflix. It was a $100 million deal. It got Netflix in the content business. They made an unbelievable deal. Um, because They, they must have made an unbelievable yeah. amount of money on yeah. that. Just and so, you know, they've been very successful in both film and television. On the TV side, most recently, they have had The Great. They had Ozark. They had Terminal List. They've got a lot going on on TV and on film. Ozark was there. Yes, oh. Ozark was there. On, te- on film, they did the first Knives Out. They did Ted. They did Ted, Bruno. They've done tons of movies. So... And invested in movies. And they did Bruno. They've invested passively as well as putting them together. And so in 2019, actually, Bri Adler and Jonathan Golfman, who are now the co-presidents, had gone around town talking because they're an independent studio and they mm-hmm. don't have distribution by design. Right. They went around town sort of canvassing all of the buyers saying, what do you need? Like, what are you looking for that you don't have? And it started to formulate around three buckets. So it was lower budget comedy romance, like Nick Sparks kinds of movies, and movies for an older audience. And so and let's be clear yeah. about something. Yeah. Uh two of those three, mm-hmm. the romance and the low budget comedies, are both non theatrical correct studio level movies at this point. That's right. So they were smart enough to talk to all the players. Yes, they did. Not just the studios. No, no. They talked to everybody. That's they right. And I, I didn't even know that and yes. I could tell you because you're absolutely right. People love those movies Mm -hmm. that you just – people love comedies and people love romantic comedies. They also – and romances, sorry. But also an underserved market, Mm -hmm. which is where you stepped That's right. So they reached out to me because I had produced the film Las Vegas. Which made over, what, $135 million? 170-something. 170. Yeah, worldwide. Wow. And um, was made on a very reasonable budget. It was $29 net. Wait, Las Vegas. Las Vegas made 
How much overall? $172 million worldwide. Wow. On a $29 million net budget. So it was about 33 and change gross. That's an incredible yes, return. Yes, very successful. So I had produced that, and I had made, as a studio executive, I had made Something's Gotta Give. I had made The Holiday. I'd worked with Jim Brooks. So I had a sort of affinity for this world in terms of telling stories for for and about an older audience. And at a price. Yes, at a price. So I sat down with them, and they had a really innovative idea, which I really respected, which is they didn't want – to just bring in more bodies into the studio so they would have more overhead so then they would source these movies but then have to go hire a producer. And they said, look, what we really want is a hybrid. We want someone who has studio experience and someone who knows how to produce a movie. And this is the space. And I said, OK, let me dig in. And I went and did my own research. So they approached you. Yes. I went, and I wish it had been my idea. Like, I think about that all the time. Like, I wish I had said, like, oh, I hate gosh. to tell you this, but you did have that idea <laughs> at one point. Yeah. I have heard. I did hear that idea at one I, point. You probably did. But what I did is I actually went back 30 years and looked at every theatrical release. Because at this time, it was 2019. COVID hadn't happened yet. So there was still this sort of theatrical maybe play on all these films before everything, you know, went kablooey. But, you know, I did my own list of every movie I thought sort of ticked the boxes of the lane we wanted to be in, which is certain. Wild hogs. Yes, it was it was like comedy, that. romantic comedy, action comedy, like red, anything that right, was in this right. space. They had certain creative signposts, certain thematic signposts, certain casting signposts, certain budget parameters. And I'm not exaggerating. Almost without fail, every one of them worked. The ones that didn't work were not consistent. And in, in their theme or tone. Like too or... heavy drama. No really sticky idea, right? Mm-hmm, it was just mm-hmm. like two people talking for a couple of hours. But when you looked all the way back to Grumpy Old Men, when you looked at the movies that were made for and about an older audience that hit certain themes of second chances, starting over, finding love again, you know, grand adventures, the bucket list, not the movie, but the bucket list of life. Well, and the bucket and list. And the bucket list. <laughs> Terrific picture. They almost always worked. So what we did is looked at 30 years of movies and saw that there are certain creative, thematic, casting, and financial guidelines, signposts, that if the movies adhered to that, they almost always succeeded. I would literally say to you the rate of return on them from a success standpoint was about 80%. And I'll send you the list. Listeners, learn from this. Do your research. Do secondary research. It doesn't cost anything. Go in. Be smarter than the other person who's not necessarily analyzing movie after movie and trying to figure out what themes and and elements work. That is smart. I wanted to make sure that I understood the lane they were in. And, you know, the other thing I got really excited about was that you're talking about a cohort of the audience, not a genre. So I'm not selling just comedy or just romance or just horror. I'm selling to an audience for an audience. Let me ask you this. Is it more liberating? Oh, 100%. I kind of knew what you were going to say because how could it not be? 100%. Because now you have filters Mm -hmm. that say, well, I like that, but let someone else do that. Well, I'll give you a perfect example. So um, there was a script that went out. Last year, with a very big director attached and three massive movie stars, one of whom was Morgan Freeman. So, you know, it's obviously he's like one of the holy grail for the space, blah, blah, blah. Um, the movie cost the, bud- the original budget I saw was over 60. And it was a noir whodunit that took place in a nursing home. And I passed. And the producer, it never sold, by the way, came back to me again with a lower budget. It was a good script, too? It was a fine script. But here's the problem. Yeah. Okay. Setting aside the the budget, which was too big for our threshold, Mm -hmm. roughly 20 gross, which is 15 to 17 net, depending on where you shoot them, give or take, depending upon cast, whatever. But we're really trying to be disciplined in how we put them together. There's no wish fulfillment in any movie ever taking place in a nursing home for my audience. Cocoon? Not really about the nursing home. It's about something else. Yeah, and they don't spend almost any time in the nursing home. That's right. You're right. 
And it's getting the new life right. force. Yeah. And it was a noir. And with some humor. And so it didn't live in any of the clear filters that we had identified for ourselves that made sense. And, and you've been in the position of having that wonderful post-mortem with yourself oh. saying, I should have listened to oh. that little voice. Oh, for sure. And a lot of people haven't had that. You know, and it's really scary for anyone who's listening. It doesn't ever get any easier to pass on a project that has three massive movie stars, including Morgan Freeman. I'm sure every one of your guests who comes on here can talk about big movies that they passed on or big shows that they passed on. But it was really liberating because it didn't fit. It didn't go into any of the filters that we're really using to decide what we're making. And why I respect you so much, one of the many reasons, <laughs> is because you do have the wherewithal to stand up to the people around you that may say, what are you, nuts to mm -hmm. pass on this? I just talked to a head of a studio about this. We spoke about one's superpower. Mm -hmm. And one of the superpowers of this particular person was their ability to be authentic and to be honest with themselves mm. and not be swayed. Mm -hmm. And on the bad side of that can come arrogance. Of on the positive side is you win every time. Right, right. Because you do everything for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. And you rely then on your experience and comps and research and the fact that you've been doing this a really long time. But it's very hard to do that in the beginning of one's career. Oh, for sure. I say this to everybody, students and young people who are working for me. I say your opinion is your number one currency. And so it isn't, especially when you're an executive. Use it wisely. Use it wisely and get and and spend time honing it because that's what will distinguish you. If you just are sort of milk toasty, wishy washy about everything, or you're afraid to offend someone. I mean, there's ways of passing. I'll never forget um, one time we had a movie with Spike Jones, and I had already made a movie with I'd made adaptation, adaptation with him um, at Sony and. Uh, he had brought something else to us, and Amy Pascal, we didn't want to make it. And Amy passed in a very direct and respectful way, and he said thank you, you know, because there Absolutely. wasn't – we weren't beating around the bush. We weren't holding him back. We that weren't... is so important. Just, you know, just answer in an, yes. an honest way. I sometimes say, you know, sometimes I'll have to let someone go. Mm -hmm. And the person, if you do it in a classy way, will come back to you 10 years. The best thing you ever did was yes, fired me. that's right. Because right. it just wasn't the right fit. Right. That's great. We're going to take a break. When we come back, I'm going to turn the tables a little bit because I want to hear about how Amy became Amy. <laughs> we'll be back in a moment. Get a glimpse into a secret part of Hollywood that few are aware of and that filmmakers rarely talk about. In the new book, Audienceology by Kevin Getz. Each chapter is filled with never-before-revealed inside stories and interviews from famous studio chiefs, directors, producers, and movie stars, bringing the art and science of audienceology into focus. Audienceology, how moviegoers shape the films we love. From Tiller Press at Simon & Schuster, available now. Okay, so we talked so much about some of the technical stuff of what it takes to be in Amy's head <laughs> when you get to that green light. What was it like growing up with Tom Bosley as a dad? What was it like <laughs> then finding your selfhood, your individuality? It was funny. When you were talking in the intro, I kept thinking, oh, God, maybe I'm a Nepo baby, too. Is it Nepo or Nepo baby? I don't know what those what the new ones are now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is. Oh, you know this whole new movement of like, like nepotism. Yes. So it'd be nepos. Then. Okay, nepo. So maybe I'm a I'm a sort of pseudo nepo baby, but not really. Nobody a, gave you anything. No, no, they didn't. So um, he was a great dad, great dad, very down to earth. I think um, part of what my groundedness comes from is him, because he was born and raised in the Midwest, and he actually didn't have massive success professionally until his forties. You know, he did have Broadway success, but he that was in his mid thirties and then It's you astounding. Know, yeah. Do you remember sort of I don't want to say struggling, but until that really hit, was it just he was a working actor? Yes. The reality is Happy Days was what my dad did while I was in high from kindergarten to high twelfth grade. Oh my lord. So your dad went and did something every day, and that's yeah. what my dad went and did every day. And um he was home for dinner four nights a week except for Friday nights when they taped the show. Did you go to the show? Oh yeah, all the time. All the time. So 
Were you he, friends with all of those or any of them? Yeah. Yeah. Still friendly. In fact, with Ron? I, Ron called me a, like a month ago. I love that man. I have oh, to say, so shout lovely. out. And he uh, he will be a guest on here. He's I, so I guarantee lovely. I'm going to twist his arm, but I don't, may not have to twist too hard, I'm hoping. But he's just the best. Oh, he's lovely. He's another one that really gets the audience. Yes, he I does. can imagine you, you know, rapping with Ron on the set of, of Happy Days. <laughs> no, they were all. Really lovely. Really? Anson Williams and I just did a book He's signing great. together, too. Anson's great. Would you read about this thing He's in Ohio? mayor of Ohio. Or no, he ran he, for mayor? Or? No, he ran, but he lost like by 18 votes. What? So he asked for a recount, and then he just conceded. Aww. I was like, I know, and he's so nice. Just give him the damn oh, mayor, say, mayoral, the mayoral pe- ship or whatever. Who are the 18 people that wouldn't vote for Potsy? I know. I'm going to go That's up terrible. there personally. <laughs> I know. Exactly. And then Henry, of course, yes. is, is just a treasure. And I just saw Marion. Did you? I saw her at uh, the Thalians oh, Ball. Oh, how Marian is she? Ross. I didn't really talk with her too much, but she just, she looks great. Yeah, she does. She's aged she incredibly well. Anyway, so you went to the set yeah, and you once a were, week. these were like your buddies, yeah. right? Those are my dad's work colleagues, right? So he is, he was a big reason for my love of movies because he was steeped in early to mid 20th century film. There was sort of a gap from like the 60s to the 80s. And I attribute that to the fact that he had me and he was also starting on the show. So he was busy with other things. He was never under contract. No, no, mm -mm, no. He came after that. Yeah, he came after that. But he was very successful, as you know, in theater in New York. And then Fiorello. Yes. Which he won a Tony for. Wow. But then he ended up having to come out to Los Angeles because there was more work here. Broadway started to really dry up in the late 60s. And there was more and more happening out here for actors. Was he married to your mom or Patricia? To my mom. To my mom. Uh They met in Fiorello. She was a dancer who came into the chorus. Wow. Mm -hmm. And what happened to your mom? She passed away when I was was 78. So I was almost 12. Yeah, she had, she'd been sick have, for a really long time. But that time. must have been super hard. It was you. hard. It was hard. And I was an only child, so it was just me and my dad. And um, he was the best, huh? He was exactly what you would hope <laughs> Mr. C would be like in real life. That was a big piece of who he was. Was it true what I said? Like, it was kind of like you were his daughter. Oh, the, the joke, and if you ever have Amy Pascal on or Matt Tolmack, one of my yeah. former colleagues who's now a very successful producer, we would sit in meetings at Sony and in the middle of a meeting as a non sequitur, they would say, do you know who her father is? And I would, I would say, oh, you know you? I always say that. And, and I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> this has nothing to do with anything going on in this meeting. And they're like, yeah, but it's just so cool. I'm like, OK. But you know what's really funny now is young people don't remember it as much. They don't really know. I know. It's like, so sad. I was just – who was I just <laughs> saying? That? Oh, I got a – I'm not name dropping, yeah. but I got a call from Senator Bill Bradley right? this morning. And I'm working with Bill on a documentary that he financed oh, and cool. stars in – and he's an amazing man. Yeah. I mean, what he's accomplished. Sure. And I remember we were talking about the focus group and, he, you know, there were two diagnostic things about the pace and length. And then there was something about the visuals and or lack thereof. And, and I said, well, you can help the pace. I don't know what you're really going to do about the visuals. But he said the third thing, though, that I read in all the cards was a lot of people that don't know me. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, they kind of know You've heard they heard the name, mm-hmm. but I was saying those same people don't even know who Frank Sinatra right. or Barbara Streisand oh, yeah. are, and I'm like, this is ridiculous. Yeah, I think people should be thrown out of school. If oh, they don't I know have this conversation people. all the time with people in my office where I'll mention a movie and they'll say, "What is that?" And I literally say, "Leave my office and don't come back until you've seen the film." Oh, I, oh my God, I love what you just said. When I was in acting school, acting mm-hmm. conservatory, and I went to one of the best. I'll give a shout out mm-hmm. to Mason Gross School of mm-hmm. the Arts at Rutgers. We had to know certain people if we didn't know. And I'm not talking about Frank Sinatra and Barbara Streisand and Tom Bosley. I'm talking about Eleonora Duza or Sarah Bernhardt or whoever it was. And they would say, get up and do a report on it and come back Mm -hmm. when you know who that person is. Mm -hmm. And so when I teach at the film schools, whether it's Chapman or UCLA or USC or North Carolina School of the Mm -hmm. Arts or AFI or NYU – I always give them lists of people in the beginning, and I say, these are people you should know. Matt does a list for our students because we've done it for three semesters now. It's Matt's must-see list. I love that. And it's of 20, movies yes, or of movies. People. It's 25 movies that you, ha- you have to – even if you're 
19 years old and a sophomore in college, you need to see these movies. There are directing students who yes. do not know who John Ford no, is. No, I know. Who's won I know. four Academy Awards. I know. And even if they don't know who John Ford is, they've watched Quentin Tarantino movies and he's been influenced by John Ford. So how can you not know 100%. the influence of your favorite filmmakers? So, exactly. yeah, I know. So you leave Georgetown. Yes. What was your major? English. I, I love English, English majors, major. by the way. I was an English major. I love English majors. I, I hire a lot of them. Because it prepared me for what I ended up doing. And I talk about it a lot with students who are nervous. I'm not a film major. It's like, it's okay. Don't worry about it. You know, the thing about being an English major, when I can't <laughs> talk about my, my timing, when I graduated, I graduated in 88 and came back out here to get a job and there was a writer's strike seems to follow me around, the writer strikes. So, uh, but at <laughs> they the fire time, all of us around. I know. I could base the cadence of the success of my business over the last 30-plus right. years On by labor. the strikes, the strikes. So, you know, but I, when I came out and I did a bunch of temp jobs and all sorts of things, and then I ended up getting a job at CAA, it was a great opportunity because I learned the business. Did you enter the mailroom? No. No, I was just an assistant, which is different. Did they always do that? Or? Yes. They, they still hire assistants who don't want to be in the mailroom that are just assistants. And I, did you go right to Jay's desk? Yes. I was hired by Jay. And I've only heard the greatest things about him. I never really got oh, to know he him. he was amazing. I mean, again, another person that a whole generation of people don't yeah. know who he, was he is. He was a very influential agent. Extremely. And, and one of the Young Turks. Yes, he was. He was one of the original Young Turks. He was at a USC student. He dropped out to be Mike Ovitz's assistant. And what started as the second assistant to David O'Connor, another one of the Young Turks, Doc. and then got and then got promoted and then became an agent in his own right. And when he was promoted, they told him he could hire an assistant. And that's when I went in there and was interviewing and he hired me. And the thing about Jay, at first I thought, like, what am I going to learn from this guy? He's only five years older than me. Did you – hold on. You said you were a Nepo. Yeah. Baby. Or a product of that yeah. phenomenon. Did your dad help you get in? There was one job I got as a result of his relationships. And that was I was a PA on an Imagine Entertainment TV pilot. It was one week. That was it. Everything else <laughs> I had to do. Sorry. I just had to laugh. Great. I wanted to because I know I knew the answer to that. There is and I know you did it on your own. And really. there was nothing he could. Honestly, he was an actor. Right. It wasn't like. He was running a studio. Yeah, but sometimes if it's between two people. Yeah, no. And I've gotten a call from somebody saying, oh, my my kid sure. is up for the job. That you person usually gets the job. Yeah, no, I... I can't lie to you. I met, you know... But if they're not... Imagine, by the way, if they're more... If the other one's more talented... Yeah, I'm course. saying if all things are equal, all and you know, are, sometimes that happens. I just course. don't know which way to go. Right. That nepotism could actually... No, it didn't. All that happened was I got an interview at Imagine because of Ron and... I was a PA for one week on a sound stage. This is how long ago it was. I answered the set phone, right? This is when there was still like a phone at the front door and it would light up and you would pick it up and say like stage 20 and they would say, oh, I need to speak to so-and-so. And then I would go and that, that was the job. That was the only connection job I got. Everything else I did on my own. And then you got to the studio, how? So, yeah, so I was working for Jay, and Jay was a talent agent. I hate to say it. They called me when you entered D-Girls, didn't they? Yes. Oh, Ugh. yes. Remember Premier Magazine did that whole piece on D-Girls? So, yeah, D-Girls, development girls, and it's so it's so sexist. It is it's so, so sexist. Awful. So what happened was I worked for Jay for a year, and I knew I never wanted to be an agent. But what was happening is people would call him. He wouldn't be there, and I'd end up talking to them. So I got to know a lot of the people who were in the business at that time who were young executives who were calling him. He wasn't there, and I was like, hey, how's it going? And one of those people was Stacy Snyder. And Stacy and I became very good friends, and at one point she said, do you want to be an agent? And I said, no. And purely coincidentally, as luck would have it, Stacy at the time was working for John Peters and Peter Goober. They had just been hired to run Sony. They were moving their entire company over to Sony. And Stacy was going to be a senior executive over there and needed a junior executive. So by virtue of my experience of sitting on Jay's desk, that's how I got to know Stacy. And because I was an English major and had spent so much time reading and writing critically about everything I was reading, it started to hone my ability to write about material. 
and do notes and coverage, and coverage and, and all that stuff. And do it well. And and learn to do it and well. And really articulate yes. what you needed to Correct. lay down. And, right? Correct. And, yeah. and that's how I got yeah. to Sony. And so I started in June of 1990 at Sony. And I joke about it, but I had the same address for 17 years, but I worked for three completely different companies. Were you there when they – didn't they do Basic Instinct? TriStar? Yes. I would that just – I just – just after. Because what happened was Goober Peters Entertainment was set up right when John and Peter took over the studio. It existed for about a year and a half, and then they folded it into TriStar. And Stacy became president of production at TriStar. Then Mark Platt came in to be chairman of TriStar. But they had just made Basic Instinct right before we got there. So I was at Goober Peters for like two years, and then I was at TriStar for like five and a half, and then I was at Columbia because they merged TriStar into Columbia. I was going to say there were people that did not benefit from that merger. No, <laughs> and there you, were a lot of who, people. Who that, were your colleagues then? I know some of those names, but let's. So then it was. Let's, let's do a shout out. Chris Lee, Michael Bestman, Mike Metavoy was there. Stacy, obviously. Kevin Jones. No, Kevin wasn't. Kevin Misher. No, Kevin Jones. I was Kevin thinking. was at uh, Paramount at the time. Oh, got it. But he did come over, right? Mm-mm. To Columbia? Mm-mm. Oh, he, he was at Columbia. This was right. at TriStar. Oh, oh, got it. This was at TriStar. So it was Kevin Misher. And then at Columbia, it was um, Lisa Henson, Barry Josephson. Lucy Fisher, Lucy right. Fisher, Teddy Z, Kevin Jones. Oh, Lord. Uh, Darius Hatch. Uh, who else? Bob Jaffe was a junior executive at the time. John Jashney was a junior executive oh, at the time. God. Yeah, there was it was it was fun. It was a good group. But and think about all Doug these Belgrad. Oh, who um, ended up becoming with Matt co-president, yes, co-president of Columbia. Yeah. That's right. So um, yeah, and this so, is before the great Ange. And before the great, well, Ange was Stacy's assistant. Ange Gianetti. Yes, she was Stacy's assistant. Then became a CE. And then Stacy and Mark left and went to Universal, and we stayed at Columbia, and she became my CE, and now she's the senior most executive at Columbia. Did you feel it was your moral obligation to help as many women as you have? I just want to say, you put your money where your mouth is. (laughs) You have been dedicated to advancing women in our business, thank God. Mm. Tell me about that. And Um, all the way that got you to the president of Women in Film. You know. I've had this really unique situation in my career because I had a lot of female mentors. And I had Stacy, I had Amy Pascal, I had Lucy Fisher. They were all incredibly successful women, all of whom had children, all of whom were supportive of a work-life balance. It really wasn't until I left Sony that I realized how unique that experience was and how many of my female colleagues around the business were not as supported as I was when it came to my choices about, you know, wanting to have a family as well as a career. The thing I try to do, I feel like a lot of women don't talk to each other about what they're going through and what they're up against. So what I... Especially if they have families. Correct. I really try to be honest about what you're up against and how you can accomplish it and how to be self-supporting and also to cut yourself some slack. Because the reality is when you're in this business, when you're a working woman who wants to have a child, it isn't the same as when you're a man who wants to have a child or wants to have a family. Women have to get pregnant, be pregnant, have the baby, have maternity leave, and then re-enter. I always thought that was one of the reasons of the lack of female directors. Mm. Because even as a producer, you can show up and work often remotely mm-hmm. if you need to. But as a director, you have to of be course. there every day, day all in, of day the, out. All of the HODs, all of the heads of departments, you know, when you're thinking about being on location. But especially a director, absolutely. they have to show up. Absolutely. When I joined Women in Film's board in 2014, Kathy Schulman, my predecessor, very successful producer in her own right, um, had asked me to join. And one of the things that I really appreciated about it when I got there was it was a community of women who were talking to each other, which wasn't something I had really experienced in a very long time. I had these mentors early on in my career, and then there was this big sort of time frame where I kind of was on my own, right? It was like I was a parent and an executive, and then I left and went to CBS, and I was running a company. And, you know, I remember going into some of those corporate meetings, and I was one of two women sitting at a table, three women, and it was all men. And so what I loved about 
women in film was that there was this burgeoning community of women who were actually talking to each other and being sort of candid and honest. And women have also had a tendency, certainly, I don't think so much the younger generations of women, but up until a point, there's been this thing of, well, yeah, you can have a lot of women in the room, but there can really only be one at the table. And that is a function of women, what they had to go through. I'm empathetic to it because, you know, if you're a certain age in this business, you had to kill yourself to get to the table, right? You had to really sort of be focused and make some choices that you might not have made personally and professionally in order to be there. So I think the more that women are in communication with each other, in community with each other, the more they understand that they're all in it together. So that's really what matters to me most. And one of the reasons why I wanted to take on the board president role, because I think building community for and with and amongst women is something that is desperately needed in this business. And it's something that men just do much better. When men need something or need help, they talk to each other and women don't do it. I think the LGBTQ community is better at it than women. I absolutely agree. But I didn't think women don't do it. But you're you're uh, are you thinking that that's changing? Now? I think it is beginning to change. That's but great. I think women have. Why is that? Well, I think Me Too changed a lot of stuff where finally everybody started saying like the sort of open secret that they were afraid to reveal because they felt like if I say it, then I'm weak and you're going to think less of Ah, me. And, you know, that makes sense. And there were so many years where there were women that were doing everything they could to get that top job that they didn't want to talk about their aspirations to having a family and having children. And that was sort of seen as like a not a weakness, but. Not a, a deficit, deficit. Well, it's, it was yeah. a demerit. You know what I mean? Like, I don't even know it was a deficit. I remember my, my I remember so many women in the day saying, um, I'm pregnant, don't tell anybody. Right, of course. You know? Oh, yeah. I mean, I remember that my mantra that I lived by was don't ask permission, but don't use it as an excuse, right? Like, mm. I, I didn't mm. want to talk mm. about it. So I never said, oh, I can't make that meeting because I have a mommy in me class or I have a parent teacher conference, but I never asked permission. I never said, can I go? I just did it. And my career, and I talk about this to anybody who will listen to me, my career kind of plateaued for a while while I was having kids because there was a moment in time where Matt Tolmec and Doug Belgrad became co-presidents of Columbia, and I didn't. And there was no question. It was in part a function of the fact that— Right. It's not to diminish them at all. It's just to say they— Were there. Yes. Yeah. And I had just had my second child. But I also was able to sort of mind shift it and say, look, I can be the senior most executive for and with them. And then as my kids got older, I ended up getting an even bigger job. You're you're incredible. Uh, What's Amy Bear's superpower? I would say I am authentic and I am decent. Those are indeed superpowers. I think that that's probably what I would say. And going back to my father, I think that my father was decent, super decent, and he was extremely authentic. And that was modeled for me. I do everything I can to conduct myself that way in business. And it doesn't mean I'm not, you know, don't have moments of insecurity and vulnerability. Or are a pushover in any way. No, 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 definitely not. I also don't take anything personal in business. And and once you sort of— What a of, great piece of advice for well, younger folks. Once you learn that, it makes your life so much easier because nothing in business is personal. Nothing. I mean, we could get very meta and say nothing is really personal ever, but I would say specifically in business, nothing is personal. It's Understood. all about the business. Absolutely. I think that's another superpower just because it and it's very liberating. And once I was able to learn that, it made my day-to-day a lot more enjoyable. What's on the horizon that you're excited about before we break? What Tell us the most oh. – uh, the thing that makes you excited to get out of bed. Oh, my world. gosh. Um, is there a particular project? The thing I'm most excited about is that we have two movies for sure at Landline that are happening the first part of this year and maybe more. Like we've got another three that we're in the process of packaging, one of which I so wish I could talk about because it is such a home run and I'm going to tell you offline and I'm going to come back when we're making it okay, and okay. we can talk deal, about it deal, more. Deal. But I'm really excited about those. And I really want to build – I believe that Landline has an opportunity to sort of be its own brand. What's Landline 
Was that an existing name, by the way, or did no? You... They, we came up with it. You came up with yeah, it together, which was Got just it. like if you know what a landline is, our movies are for you, right? It's like if you know, then you know. <laughs> I was like, throw me a landline. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think what gets me excited is for this year, in addition to those two movies that we're going, one of which we've already announced, which is the Renee Zellweger movie, um, Back Nine, that Michael Patrick King wrote and is going to direct. How and fun fantastic. is that? I call it a coming of middle age movie. Kind of a Bridget Jones? Yeah, well, it ish. She plays a woman who's in her early 50s who um, had given up a career as a pro golfer to support her husband, who was a pro golfer. And in the top of the movie, she's empty nested and she finds out that her husband has been cheating on her and she throws him out and decides that she's going to go back to her golf career. And she d- she starts a quest to join the LPGA. Can I at say age two 50. words? Yeah. Brian Banks. <laughs> Another movie you should check out, guys, <laughs> ladies, men, who are ever listening. It's a terrific picture. But the theme, yeah. very interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, so I think that the opportunity for Landline is something that I'm really excited about because I think in the same way that Jason Blum has sort of cornered you know, all things horror with Blumhouse, I think being able to own a, li- own a lane own now. Own a lane is a really exciting opportunity. What a great thing to end with. Amy, it's been such a pleasure having you here. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And to our listeners, listen, I hope you enjoyed today's interview. If you haven't seen them, check out so many of these movies that Amy has been mentioning today. There are so many good ones. For other stories like this, please check out my book, Audienceology, at Amazon or wherever books are sold or through my website at kevingets360.com. You can also follow me on my social media at kevingets360. Next time on Don't Kill the Messenger, we will welcome post-production producer and supervisor, the amazing Nancy Kerhofer. I thought I'd get a different perspective and bring that to you all on how screenings, research screenings, and the process works in that post-production area of a film's life cycle. Until next time... I'm Kevin Getz, and to you, our listeners, I appreciate you being part of the movie-making process. Your opinions matter.